start. Great. Okay. Yep. It's going. Okay. Thanks very much, Stefan, for that introduction. And uh, thanks everyone for, for uh, participating today. Um, my research covers a whole lot of different areas, really. One of the areas that I've been focusing on for a long time is farmer behavior, farmer adoption of new practices. So uh, when Stefan suggested that I could give a presentation today, we talked about topics and honed in on this one because obviously it's very relevant to, uh, to what you're doing. So let me try and make this quick. Here we go. So within uh, economics more generally, there has recently been a bit of a, a, a boom or a new focus on behavior, including the, the development of a new sort of sub-discipline called behavioral economics, um, which is sort of a, a collaboration between economics and, and psychology. So there's a lot of interest in people's behavior. Uh, but it's interesting to me that within agricultural economics, behavior has always been an important focus. And really back since the 50s, there have been many, many studies done of farmers' behaviour, especially focusing on farmers' behaviour in terms of adopting new farming practices or new technologies, new farming systems. So it's something that, that we've been interested in for, for a very long time. And so I'm going to look at that body of research, drawing from my, my own research findings, but also more broadly from across the, the huge number of studies uh, that, have, that have been done in this area to try and draw out some key lessons, some key insights that are very general. I think that th these are findings that we can be confident uh, apply quite broadly and, and we can use these insights to help us think about behaviour when we're thinking about research or extension or policy. All right, so as I've said, there's, there's been many studies. In fact, there's been thousands of studies of uh, adoption of new practices in agriculture, many by agricultural economists, but also studies by uh, rural sociologists and by people who specialize in agricultural extension. But the, uh, the, the first group of studies that were done were in the 1950s in the US, looking at the adoption of hybrid corn. And in that little graph, you can see the pattern of adoption that they, that they found and how it varied between different American states. And that really set the whole area of work in, you know, on, a, on an agricultural adoption going. Uh, and as I say, there's many studies out there. A large proportion of the studies that exist are statistical studies of the actual adoption of new practices after the event, they are, they are looking back at adoption that has already occurred, or they're looking at adoption that is in the process of occurring at the time and trying to understand the, the drivers, the constraints, the barriers to that adoption. So mostly they, they are cross-sectional studies. They, they look at uh, adoption at a particular point in time and explain differences between different regions or between different farmers. Some of them are longitudinal. They're trying to explain adoption over time. And most of them are survey-based. So they, they, they involve collecting data from individual farmers and then uh, including data about adoption, but also data about the farmer's characteristics, the farm's characteristics and many other issues and trying to explain the adoption with those variables. So, well, in a nutshell, what have we learned? So here's a, here's a set of key findings that I, that I think you could say that we've learned. And some of them might seem fairly obvious, particularly this first one. And that is that farmers do adopt attractive innovations. And to, as evidence of that, I've got a graph there that shows the long-term uh, changes in cereal yields in the United Kingdom, starting in the year 1270 and going up to almost the present. And of course, yields have increased enormously over that time frame, uh, And that reflects the fact that farmers have been doing things differently. They've been using different inputs, more inputs, new technologies, new crop varieties, um, and so on. So uh, 
clearly adoption of new innovations is something that is normal, it is routine, it's constantly happening, but it doesn't happen for all innovations, but it does happen quite a lot. Uh, the next observation would be that farmers are heterogeneous. Farmers vary a lot on many dimensions. Farmers have different goals for themselves and their families and their farms. Different farmers have different skills, different preferences for the types of farming that they would like to do or the types of outcomes that they would like to achieve. Uh, they have different soils on their farms, different climate, different farm sizes. Uh, they operate different farming systems, they have different attitudes to risk, and so on and so on. There are on pretty much every dimension that you can think of, there's a, a wide variety of uh, observations for, for different farmers. And so one of the consequences of that is that even successful practices tend to be partially adopted because it's unusual for any particular new technology or new practice to be suitable, sufficiently attractive to, to be adopted by every farmer. Um, and often, you know, the, the level of adoption that is achieved is sometimes a little bit disappointing, you know, particularly for scientists who, who have a strong belief that a particular technology ought to be very highly adopted. And then when it's released to the farming community, we find that it's not quite that highly adopted. But I, you know, if you think about the heterogeneity within the farming community and between farms that it, it's less surprising. The next uh, observation, which is also something that some, it can be a little disappointing at times, is how slow adoption can be. It's not always slow. Sometimes it happens extremely quickly, but most commonly it occurs on a time frame of at least a decade and often two or three decades from the point when a technology or a practice is first available to the point where it is as fully adopted as it's ever going to be. And for people who don't work on adoption, you know, as a sort of a specialization, um, it, they often seem to think that adoption is slower than they expected it was going to be. And this, again, this is true even of practices that get quite widely adopted. So as evidence of that, just one example, the graph on the right shows the adoption of no-till uh, within Western Australia. So this is the state where I live in Australia. Uh, and the first availability of no-till when people were first talking about it and thinking about it was back in the mid 1970s. And you can see that for over 10 years, it was, there was very little adoption, just a, you know, a few percent of farmers were doing it. After about 15 years, it started to take off. And then the growth was very rapid for a while, for about a decade. And then it leveled off um, in the, in the noughties. And that pattern is very typical, you know, a slow takeoff, a, 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 then a rapid phase, and then a leveling off at some maximum level of adoption. Um, but if you look at the time frame that that took from the point when it was this technology was first available to when the adoption peaked, it was about 30 years. So even though this is a technology that is highly beneficial to farmers and would end up being, being adopted by almost all farmers, it still took 30 years to get to that point. So uh, being realistic about the time frame from adopt that over which adoption will occur is quite important. All right, so the next lesson or the next insight is about a way of thinking about what is going on during the adoption process. And I think it's very helpful to recognize that the adoption process is really a process of learning by farmers. And that learning process has been broken down into a number of different phases. Um, different researchers have done this in different ways, but this is a sort of a typical breakdown. So initially, there's a point where the, a farmer becomes aware that there's a particular problem that needs to be addressed or a particular opportunity to take up a new technology. Uh, and then having become aware, then they might move into a, a stage of what's called non-trial evaluation. So in this stage, they're thinking about this new practice or this new technology. They're trying to collect information. Maybe they're talking to their neighbors. Uh, 
maybe they're talking to extension agents. They're not yet doing it. They're not actually doing any of it on their farm. They're trying to collect information to decide whether it's worthwhile doing a trial on their farm. So that's the non-trial evaluation phase. Then they might reach a point where they say, yes, this looks like a promising technology. I will go into a trial. So most technologies, not all, but most technologies, there's a sort of a trial phase where, where farmers will test it in their own circumstances and then decide whether it works for them. If it does work for them, they'll move into adoption or they might decide to reject the, reject the technology at that point. If they do decide to adopt it, then they will, it's not a sort of a once and forever decision. They'll keep reviewing that decision over time, thinking about whether they want to continue to use it. They may change the way they use it. They may learn how to use it in a more effective way, or they may change the nature of the technology slightly, adapt it as, as, as they get experience with it. And then for many technologies, probably most in the long run, there's a point where it gets disadopted. It, the adoption ceases. That could be because uh, it, it gets superseded by another technology that is superior, or it could be because the markets change, you know, the prices of outputs change so that the product that this particular technology relates to is no longer attractive to grow or, you know, for various reasons why uh, the practice could cease to be used. All right, so I mentioned trialing as one of the important stages in that learning process. Um, and so this brings us to the concept of trialability. So trialability is one of the features of a particular practice or a technology that determines how quickly it gets adopted. And it may, in some cases, determine whether it ever gets adopted. Uh, and so trialability refers to how easy it is for a, for a farmer to get, what, get over the learning hump, to sort of get through the phase of learning out to the other side and have enough knowledge to make a decision about whether or not they want to do this technology um, for, you know, on a, on a long-term basis. And there are a number of different factors that influence how easy it is to learn about a practice, le learn about a new technology. So this, here's a list of, of factors that, that would influence this. One is whether the technology can be trialed at a small scale. It's very convenient if you can just, so for example, if a new uh, crop variety comes along and the farmer is not confident about it, they could just use it for a small area. It means the risk is low. They can learn about that new technology easily. They can observe it and then make a decision about whether to do it. The, the, the small scale means really the, the key thing about the small scale is it means it's a low cost, low risk um, thing to learn about. But that's not the case for every technology. Sometimes it's not possible to scale something down. You have to buy a whole new equipment. You can't buy part of the equipment. You've got to buy the whole equipment and it's, you know, it's an expensive piece of equipment. And so in that case, it's a little bit more difficult to move through to the stage of learning. You might be able to learn about it on somebody else's farm, but you, but you may, may not be able to trial it on your own farm. Or adopting a whole new milking system, a new, a new milking shed technology, um, you know, you can't adopt a small part of that. You have to sort of adopt the whole lot. So that makes it a little bit more difficult to, try, to trial. The cost of trialing, of course, that relates to the scale at which you need to, to do the trialing. The complexity of the technology. If the technology is very complex, that means it's more difficult possibly to interpret the results that you're observing. And so more difficult to learn about and to move rapidly through to a decision to adopt or not adopt. The similarity of this new technology to existing technologies. This is, if, if the new technology you're thinking about is quite similar to something you already do, that's very convenient because it makes it easy to interpret the results that you see. It means that if you, for example, if you, if you try, so, so a great example here would be a new crop variety. You're already growing wheat. You know how to grow wheat. You know how to interpret the results of a wheat crop's yield. Then you try a new crop variety and you observe what it does. It's very easy to determine whether that was a successful trial or not. But if it's a completely different technology, like if you're a wheat producer and you're now 
uh, growing a legume crop and you've never grown a legume crop before, you don't know whether that's whether what you've observed is a good result or a poor result. Maybe it's a poor result because you didn't do it properly because you're inexperienced. And so it's not good information about the potential gains from that technology because once you learn to do it, you'll get a better result. So the similarity with what you're currently doing helps you interpret the, uh, the results that you receive. The visibility or the detectability of the result if the new technology that you're, you're adopting is, say, for example, it's about improving soil condition. And so what's going on is under the soil. I did a lot of work on uh, the salinization of soils. And it's very difficult in that situation to know whether what you're, you're doing is working because what's going on is, is beneath the ground and it's probably quite slow. And so it's not observable. So it takes a while for you to work out whether the, the, the practice that you're trialing or using is actually working. And then of course, other sort of interacting with these factors would be things like the education level of the farmers and the advisory support that's available to them. So there's a whole host of variables here that influence how easy it is for farmers to learn about a new practice. And that influences how quickly they will make a decision to adopt it or not adopt it. And it may influence whether they make that, that decision at all. If it's just too difficult to learn about, they may never get to the point of adopting just for that reason in some cases. Okay, then the second group of factors. So there's, there's two main groups of influences on these adoption decisions that I'll talk about. So trialability was one, relative advantage is the other. And this is about relative advantage means how good is this practice that you're thinking about doing relative to what you were already doing? Is it going to make your farm business or your farm family better off than it would have been or, or no better off or even worse off? And again, there's a, a suite of influences, a suite of factors here that influence whether or not the, the practice is, is beneficial for a particular farmer. And of course, it can vary between farmers. Um, and I've broken this into two groups of, of factors. One is about characteristics of the practice itself. And the other is about the characteristics of the farmer. And it's the bringing together of those two things that determine whether a practice is a good practice for that farmer. It's important to recognize that a practice could be good for some farmers, but not for others just because of the characteristics of the farmers. There are different attitudes, different skills, different motivations of the different farmers. So let's just focus on the practice characteristics. Of course, the profitability of the practice and including whether there's any, you know, if we're talking about sustainability practices, which I've done a lot of work on, whether there's uh, stewardship payments available, the riskiness of the practice, how costly it is to adopt, how complex it is. I mentioned complexity already in terms of trialing, but complexity is also an issue when it comes to relative advantage. If it's very complex, it might not be very attractive to farmers just because it's harder to do, harder to actually implement. Environmental impacts could be important for some farmers, maybe not for all, but certainly for some. And then ease and convenience. So in Australia, I was telling uh, Stefan yesterday, uh, many of our farmers are now operating extremely large properties 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 hectares in some cases. And so they really put a high value on the ease and convenience of the technologies that they adopt. And then on the farmer characteristic size aside, how important is profitability to them? Is that a main motivating factor? Their attitudes to risk, their attitudes to environmental outcomes and their family goals could also come into play um, depending on, it could influence the sorts of activities that they uh, are interested in. And of course, family goals could, in, could interact with those other things. You know, family members could have strong environmental values, or there could be a particular need for income to deliver family goals. Uh, you know, a desire to put children through an expensive, high quality school would, could mean that you have a high um, motivation to generate extra profit. So they, there's an interaction potentially there. And as I've already said, both the innovation and the adopter matter in terms of determining the relative advantage of a new practice. 
uh, it's the interaction between the goals of the potential adopters and how well a particular practice delivers those goals. So for example, how profit motivated are the, are the farmers and how profitable is the practice? What they, those two things come together to determine you know, how, how you think about that particular practice. Or how much does the farmer think about risk? How, how much are they concerned about the riskiness of their farm? And how risky is this practice? Is it more or less risky than what the farmer is already doing? So those two things sort of interact. All right, and then of course, there's a range of social and cultural and communication related issues that come into play as well uh, to a greater or lesser extent and in different ways in different cultures and different countries I've observed. Um, and maybe different you know, cultural groups within a country might have different norms in, that come into play uh, when it com comes to adoption of new practices. So I've listed here things like social networks, how strong are the social networks, which can influence how strongly information about our new practice will move between farmers within an area. Physical proximity. There's been quite a lot of research that shows that adoption is influenced by, by just how close the nearest adopter is, the nearest existing adopter is to a, a new potential adopter, or how close a potential adopter is to an extension uh, office. You know, where does, where's the, the town that the extension agents operate out of? And the farmers that live closer to that town are more likely to adopt. And, and you know, you can, it's not hard to understand why that might be the case. And then the quality and the intensity of the extension services that are available. So I've talked about in very general terms, I've lumped together a whole lot of different factors that influence adoption. And I've broadly grouped them into three groups, this social, cultural, information-based factors, relative advantage of the technology for the particular farmers and the trialability of the practice. And uh, I'd observed that, so what this table is illustrating or highlighting uh, is that those different factors uh, have different levels of importance in driving or inhibiting adoption at different stages of the adoption process. So down the left-hand side, I've got those six different phases of the adoption learning process that I talked about earlier, awareness, non-trial evaluation, trial evaluation, adoption, revision, and disadoption. And then within the body of the table, the number of stars is a sort of a very loose indication of how important those factors are at that stage of the adoption process. So for example, I'm, I'm suggesting that the social factors and the cultural factors are particularly important during the early stages of the adoption process. It, they're important in raising awareness. How quickly does awareness of a new issue spread through a community? very importantly linked to social factors, including extension uh, and the non-trial evaluation stage, of course, you know, people are learning from each other. They're seeking information from each other, particularly at that stage. Uh, of course, the social factors are always important. I have stars right down, but that's the, those are the stages where they seem to be most influential. On the other hand, the actual relative advantage is most important later on in the process. So once a farmer has experience with a practice, what I've, I've observed is that they're more likely to rely on that personal experience than on, you know, you're thinking crudely about it, than on what someone else tells them. And I think you and I would behave the same, right? We would trust their own experience more than we would trust what someone else tells us. And so it's not surprising that the research tends to show that rel relative advantage is the key factor in the long term in determining actual adoption. And then the, the other factor, of course, is trialability and you know, common sense. It's the most important factor during the trial phases, the non-trial evaluation and the trial phases, less important at the other stages. All right, so I think that's quite helpful to understand and it helps you think about the, the, the potential contributions of different types of actions at different stages in the adoption process.
All right. Uh, next, I want to talk about, this is sort of a new insight, a bit of a new story. I want to make the case that although there are some common insights, and I've sort of tried to present you already with a set of fairly general, generic insights about adoption of agricultural innovations. When, it, when you look closely at any individual practice, there's often, some, there's often a number of quite specific variables related to that particular practice that are really important in driving the adoption of that practice. So I'm gonna give two examples to illustrate that, both from my experience in Western Australia. Not, these are not studies that I've done myself, but my colleagues at the University of Western Australia have, have done these two studies. The first one I'll talk about is factors influencing the adoption of integrated weed management. So the integrated weed management is a sort of a more sophisticated um, set of practices for weed management that doesn't just rely on herbicides. It, it, it's a more integrated set of non-chemical and chemical uh, control measures. And um, so research, this was a uh, cross-sectional study that was done at a particular point in time uh, and trying to understand you know, trying to explain which farmers had adopted integrated weed management and which ones had not, they tended to stick just with chemical weed management. And the factors that were found to be the most important were things like, well, initially some fairly generic variables like whether uh, the farmers were extensive uses of extension, whether the farmers had high levels of education, the length of the farmers planning horizon, did they think ahead or were they only short term thinkers? But then the other variables, the next four key variables, were all very specific to integrated weed management. Perceptions of the efficiency and efficacy of integrated weed management as a practice, whether perceptions of whether it would give them high economic returns, the perceptions of how long it might be until there was a replacement herbicide available. And one of the reasons for adopting integrated weed management is to delay the onset of herbicide resistance. So if you think that there's plenty of new herbicides coming um, from chemical manufacturers, then that's less of a concern. So that was a factor. And then the herbicide resistance status of the farm. So that, that's fairly common sense. But as, as I said, those last four practices were very specific. They were not generic. And similarly, the adoption of no-till, very high, as I showed you earlier on, very high adoption of no-till, but it took some time. And during that process, um, there were quite diff quite large differences and we could explain the differences between farmers. Again, generic variables like education, use of extension, use of a paid consultant, um, years since awareness of a nearby adopter, but then a set of variables that were specific to no-till, the occurrence of a very dry year. So soon after a dry year, they were more likely to adopt because no-till helped to conserve soil moisture. Uh, and then a set of other factors, um, the, a fall, this is early on in the process, a fall in the price of glyphosate from when it was first available, encouraged people to do no-till because glyphosate helped them to do no-till. Uh, rainfall variables, uh, the effectiveness of particular herbicides that were important in, in uh, no-till or, or, or were alternatives to no-till. And the farmers, uh, concerns about soil moisture conservation and so on. So a whole series of factors that were very specific to no-till were important, as well as the generic factors. There was some a particularly interesting finding in this study, which was a number of variables which were not found to be important explanators of adopt adoption that we thought would be, because my observation would be that no-till is probably the most important soil conservation technology that's ever been adopted in Australia. And it has been very widely adopted and it's considered a very successful technology for preventing soil conservation. But you might notice that in this list of variables, there's no mention of soil conservation, right? So there, that we did measure though, or I didn't, my colleagues did measure variables related to erosion risk, uh, soil conservation benefits from the technology as, as perceived by the farmers, and whether or not the farmers were members of a land conservation group but those variables were not significant in explaining adoption. So the key insight here is that adoption might be for reasons other than the ones that you expect. Now, even though this is a conservation technology, it wasn't necessarily soil conservation that was the driver of adoption. Uh, and I've observed that a few times, uh, you know, and I think it's sort of 
pretty well understood that ideally it's good to have a win-win technology if you can of course it's better to be promoting a win-win technology that generates benefits on a on a range of fronts not just in a sort of a narrow uh, you know a narrow type of benefits that may or may not be a top concern to farmers and ideally if a practice is highly profitable which no-till is in our environment then that's sort of the ideal in terms of getting a conservation practice adopted. Of course, not all conservation practices are economically attractive. This was lucky, this was one where it was. All right, now I wanna uh, move on to another insight and talk about uh, the drivers in terms of the, the, the scale of adoption. Now, what, what's, what are the key determinants of how much adoption actually occurs? And, and I'm going to argue that the key factor that has the biggest influence on adoption in the long run is relative advantage. How much, how much benefit does this far, do the farmers get from adopting this practice? And here's an, an illustration of that. This is adoption of a new legume crop in Western Australia. This was a study that I did do. And you'll notice that over time, of course, the adoption is growing. Uh, and these different lines relate to different regions within uh, the crop growing areas of my state. They're different shires or different you know, local government areas. And in some uh, areas, the level of adoption increased very rapidly and it increased to high levels. So that top one, it's 90% of farmers were growing this crop. And the lower, the bottom ones there, much lower levels of adoption and much slower adoption. And what's going on there is quite simple to explain. It's simply the fact that this new legume crop much prefers to grow on so sandy soils. And you can, it's almost a perfect correlation between the area of sandy soils in the different regions and the, and the number of farmers who adopt in the different regions. So and this is sort of a, a, just one simple example, just to make that case that relative advantage is just such a key factor in adoption, determining the, the eventual level of adoption in the long run. And relative advantage doesn't just mean profitability. Of course, profitability is one key factor, but as I mentioned earlier, it could be things like risk, environmental benefits, ease and convenience, and so on. Okay, so now I want to sort of tackle an issue which is I confront quite common, which is the idea that many people have which is that the best way to achieve a high level of adoption is to use very good quality extension. So to have good extension agents, good relationships between the extension agents and the farmers, and you know, just to, to have lots of extension happening. And that's a key way of ensuring that adoption will be high and rapid. And I, I guess that can be true, right? There, there are situations where that is definitely the case. But I just wanted to offer a, a slight warning that it's not always true. And in particular, it's not true in the situation where you're trying to promote a practice that has low relative advantage, right? So, so if you're trying to get adoption of a practice, but that practice is very unattractive to farmers, I think history and the, the evidence of research shows that you it's pretty much impossible to overcome that sort of unattractiveness by doing good extension. No matter how good the extension is, you, you won't overcome a very unattractive, you know, technology or practice. You might get, you'll get farmers to trial it. You'll get farmers to, to have a go and to learn about it and make, and make a decision about it. But they'll base that decision largely on their own experience rather than on the information that is given in the, in the extension. Sort of similar to what I was arguing before. Okay, so just to sort of highlight that, I wanted to um, give you a couple of quite striking results. These are not from agriculture, actually. They're from sort of the world of uh, behavioral economics or, or even just other types of, um, the next one would be from medical research, medical promotion. So there's been a number of uh, studies uh, using what are called nudges in behavioral economics. So messages to try and get people to adopt uh, practices that are believed to be in their own best interest. 
Um, and so, for example, get, trying to get people, more people to be vaccinated. This is in the pre-COVID days before um, sort of scepticism about um, vaccination was so widespread as it seems to be today. And so, you know, there were there's a number of programs experimenting with different types of messages and different strategies to increase vaccination rates. And they were successful to some degree, but when you look at the actual increase in adoption or you know, in the vaccination rates as a result of these programs, they weren't that high. Even though they, you know, at, at best, they were sort of 4%. That's an, sort of an example from a particular study. Another study looked at trying to get, this is in America, trying to get people to sign up to retirement saving, savings plans because it was felt that people didn't have enough savings for their retirement. And again, quite you know, successful to some degree, but to you know, really small impacts, one to 2% increases. And this is the most extreme example that I've ever seen. This is a, a very old study, but it's just so extreme that it's worth sort of um, worth noting, worth knowing about. This is um, an American study called Mr. Fit, which was a very ambitious clinical trial on heart disease. In this trial, they screened half a million men across uh, to recruit 12,000 men. They had very, um, very uh, de uh, demanding selection criteria across 22 states, so quite a variety of different contexts. And what they were looking for was people who they thought were at high risk of heart disease, and they thought that they were likely to be willing to comply with quite a demanding regime of changes in their behavior in terms of uh, their shopping behavior, the types of food they bought, the types of food they cooked, and their um, exercise and so on. And it was incredibly um, well designed and very expensive. They even did things like offering to, to take to, to go into individual people's homes and coach them on cooking and uh, you know, show them how to do it in a healthy way. So they did this for six years and it cost $180 million to do the trial. And at the end of the trial, there was no difference between the control group and the treatment group. Quite incredible. And the, I heard a seminar by the guy who was responsible for the trial and you know, he, he, he you know, was quite, chastened of course and you know very surprised but you know then i guess he used it to boost his understanding of what really drove behavior right you, people needed to be motivated they needed to believe that it would be really beneficial for them and for whatever reason that didn't happen in this trial partly it didn't happen partly it did happen to a small degree but what also happened was that the people who were not being helped they also changed. They also said, well, you're not helping me. I'll help myself. Um, and so that's part of the reason there was no difference. Um, so the conclusion that this guy reached was providing information to people was close to useless. Now, I don't agree that it's close to useless in agricultural extension if it's used in the right way to promote technologies that are beneficial to farmers. But we do need to be realistic about how, how beneficial it can be. And uh, so I, I think that the main contribution of agricultural extension is to accelerate adoption rather than to increase the long-term peak level. It probably can increase it a bit, but not dramatically. And in one, in one uh, this is quite difficult to do research on actually, to, to get the data and to do this, but we found uh, in one particular study, a, a one to two year acceleration of adoption. So it was worth doing, you know, in a benefit cost analysis of that, the benefits way outweighed the costs, but it wasn't as dramatic a benefit as people thought it might be. Okay, so this is obviously most relevant to practices that would be beneficial if farmers adopted them, but are not adopted yet for whatever reason. Maybe, they, maybe that's just because they're new practices. All right, I'm looking at the time. I want to allow some time for discussion. So I'll just, I might skip this bit about policy relevance or so we'll just skim through it quite briefly, just to highlight that understanding adoption is obviously relevant in many different aspects of policy, 
it, it's relevant to evaluation of policy programs that are trying to foster behaviour change. It's relevant to prioritising research. You need to know whether that was the, the outcomes of the research will be adopted. It's relevant to planning extension, of course. I think that's pretty, pretty obvious. I'm going to skip this bit. This is a, um, uh, a tool that I developed to try and make a recommendation about a policy mechanism for um, trying to achieve adoption of new practices that are more sustainable and deliver public benefits. And, and this is another context where it is really helpful to understand adoption, but uh, I'll skip this unless someone want, particularly wants me to, to talk it through. Uh, additionality is another issue. So additionality is, is the idea that when, a, when an environment, particularly an environmental type program, agri-environmental program, if we're paying farmers to do something that generates public benefits, then ideally we'd like to be paying people to do things that they weren't already going to do. And that's quite hard to do in some cases. It's difficult to know whether or not farmers would have done this practice in the absence of the, um, of the program. So being able to predict what people will do can be quite helpful in assessing whether a policy program is worth spending money on or whether we would just be paying people to do stuff that they're probably going to do anyway. And so sort of in that sense, we're wasting money. Obviously the farmers are happy, but it's not a, not a sort of an effective agri-environmental program in terms of delivering environmental outcomes that wouldn't have already happened. Okay. <clears throat> There's obviously a lot we could talk about there. I wanna finish by um, introducing you to a tool that is available to predict adoption uh, called ADOPT. So obviously if we're thinking about, I've, I've sort of made the case that understanding adoption is important, being able to predict it, adoption is valuable for a number of different reasons. How can we predict adoption? Well, there's a number of different ways that you could imagine. We could try and do lab experiments and a lot of people have done that. We can do field experiments. We can do farmer surveys. We can try and learn from published evidence from existing trials or research that's been done. Um, but they, those methods all have strengths and weaknesses. They're not all suitable for in all cases. They're not all easy either. They're quite, tends to be quite labor intensive, quite intensive uh, to, to apply most of those techniques. And so a group of us developed a new tool called ADOPT, the Adoption and Diffusion Outcome Prediction Tool. So I just want to let you know that this is available. It's a free tool that's available. Uh, you might like to investigate and see if it's interesting and useful for your research. So ADOPT is an online tool to predict voluntary adoption. It was developed by a multidisciplinary team in Australia, which include a couple of agricultural economists, a couple of well, several rural sociologists, a couple of agricultural extension specialists, and actually uh, with input from a, uh, a social psychologist as well, and people who have a lot of knowledge of farming systems. So quite a mixed group, but with a lot of experience, a very experienced group. And we pulled together a lot of evidence about, well, from existing research. But even then, even though this, this research body is enormous, we found that there were still gaps in the information that we needed. And so we ran a number of expert workshops to try and help us fill those gaps. And the, the, the output from this tool is a prediction, a quite a simple prediction of the level of adoption for a particular technology by a particular group of farmers once that adoption has peaked and how long it will take to reach that, to reach that peak level of adoption. I'll give you a bit more information in a moment. Um, the tool's been available for a while now. Um, uh, so the publication there is from 2017. That's five years old, but it was available for a couple of years before that. We've got about 1,500 users of the tool from, of many different types, policy, R&D funders, extension bodies, R&D practitioners, and in education as well. It's quite a sophisticated tool. We Underpinning it is a new conceptual framework that we, we developed. We adapted a lot. We learned a lot from review, doing a very comprehensive review of the literature. 
and we've pulled it together in a way that really tries to capture all you know as many factors as we could and and so we if we found if we could find evidence that was consistent and quantified then we included it in in the uh, in the tool there was a couple of variables that were commonly influential in the literature but were not consistent in their influence so we didn't include them <clears throat> so i'm not going to go through all 22 variables there's too many but just to sort of flag the different types of factors that are included or oh, and first of all to highlight at the top there what we're trying to do is predict the time until peak adoption and the peak level of adoption as i said the top group of variables relate to the population of potential adopters so very important to define the particular group of farmers that we're thinking about because different groups of farmers have different characteristics so we need to you know it's helpful to sort of be very clear about which farmers we're talking about because you'll get different answers to the questions for different groups of farmers and so that you want to predict it well you need to define the farm as well the bottom group of variables relate to the particular technology or innovation the left group of variables relate to learning about the practice and its relative advantage and the right group of variables relate to what how attractive is this practice going to be in the long run and that's as i've sort of highlighted is bringing together variables about the population and about the, the technology all right and so the tech the, this tool adopt as i've said has 22 different questions some questions about the farmers some questions about the technology or the practice although it's quite complicated under the underneath and there's a whole lot of equations and quantified quantified things under there for the actual user interface it's quite simple it's a series of questions with only a you know smallish number of responses usually five possible responses sometimes more but here's an example of one of the questions um, what proportion of the target population of farmers is under conditions of severe short-term financial constraints at the moment at the time when we're making the prediction so this is obviously something that could influence the time to adoption and so the range of possible answers include almost all currently have a severe short-term financial constraint so maybe they've just been through a drought for example right or at the other end almost none have currently have a short term a severe short-term financial constraint and then you know several options in between so there are a whole series of questions about the different variables on this you know each, each of those numbered boxes has a question each of them has sort of a, a one, you know, five different or sometimes more levels of possible response. We bring those together to make a quantitative prediction about the level of adoption and the time it will take to achieve adoption. Uh, this just highlights some of the validation that we did for some specific technologies, um, how accurately we were able to predict the peak level or the time to adoption pretty pretty well not perfect but good enough for the tool to be useful and to shape thinking and to shape some decision making uh, we've got two versions available one for developed countries one for developing countries um, they're, they're a little bit different they have some different questions because of the different factors that are more or less relevant in the different contexts uh, it's free well, there's a free version there's also a subscription version where we provide uh, more information and a more detailed report um, at the moment the the calibration that we've done is based on uh, on commercially oriented farmers in australia so there's obviously an opportunity for that to be adapted for different countries um, or for different types of farmers potentially and so we are open to potentially collaborating with people to adapt the tool our, our strong suggestion though is to use it in its current form at the moment and what we find is that even though it's been calibrated to an australian set of case studies 
the learnings that people generate from it and the predictions that are made are pretty good. They're pretty helpful. And so we've had a number of cases where we've, people have come to us and said, we'd like to adapt it to our situation. And we say, okay, we, we're okay with that, but we want you to try it in its current form first. And in every case, they've just decided to use it in its current form. So that's pretty encouraging. Okay, if you want to have a go, it's at adopt.csiro.au. That's the website address. All right, to wrap up, I've highlighted that there are various factors that influence farmers' behaviour when they're adopting a new practice, including social factors, relative advantage and trialability. I've highlighted that each practice has its own adoption story. I've uh, shown that an, an ability to predict adoption can be very helpful for a number of reasons. Uh, it's good to be able to have realistic expectations about adoption, the, the level and the speed of adoption, and that adopt the tool can help us have those realistic expectations. As well as adopt, I've got a few resources that you might find useful, a website, a book, and I edited a special issue of this journal. Um, so that's that's open access. All the all the papers in there are open access. And they're all sort of review papers of a type related to adoption of innovation. So there's some really, really nice papers that you can access there. Thanks, Stefan. I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dave. <laughs> wow, it was overwhelming to see how much information we got now. Yeah, I'm sorry. And, uh, a lot there. No, it is really nice. It is really nice because we we came from this, you know, from the theory towards the practice in terms of the model, and that is really, really great. And we can, I would suggest, because we are 44 people, this is really also really nice in terms of response what you had that they are really there's interest also on the topic that is nice and i would suggest i have plenty of questions myself but that we directly after the thank you very much from my side for your effort to to give us here the summary um to dive directly into the q and a's no if let's do that if you yeah let's do this and the floor is yours, dear audience, now.